Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Music Effects Design's Design Details segment. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, myself. My name is Jordan Pittner. I'm one of your hosts tonight. I'm uh, kind of the visual guy here at Music Effect Design. Hi, I'm Holly. I am one of the color guard folk for tonight. I'm actually the only one, uh, and I'll be another one of your hosts for tonight. And my name is Mike Kruger. Um, I'm an educator and composer up here in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, looking forward to talking uh, with with everyone here tonight. Um, and we have a really special guest with us tonight that we're really excited to have. So uh, Jeff Larch uh, is joining us, the guy who just waved is uh, joining us. Um, uh, we have the great fortune of knowing Jeff for a few years. Um, he is our profession director at the college, uh, at Notre Dame College, and uh, works at Willoughby South and other great programs. Um, but we want to give Jeff just a moment to kind of talk about his background. So uh, Jeff, welcome to our show. And um, if you could tell us just a little, a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, so um, I graduated from Baldwin Wallace University with a degree in percussion performance in 2015. Um, before that, I marched at Legends Drum and Bugle Corps for 2012 and 2013. Shout out Legends, you know. Um, uh, since then, I've been teaching at my alma mater, as Mike said, Willoughby South High School. Um, I started doing their percussion design and I've moved on to do the full design, um, except for visual. And now, the longer I've been at Notre Dame, I've been taking over some of the percussion design there as well. So, uh, other than that, I just do freelance percussion, um, teaching, gigs, writing, all that kind of stuff. I try to keep busy. Well, we're really glad to have you, Jeff. This has been a really cool week for us, um, having you here now. We also had Professor Reese from Miami earlier this week, uh, from Miami University Frost School of Music. So it's been a really cool week for us. Um, before we jump into the percussion side, I'd like to talk with Holly and Mike about the event we had a couple nights ago. Um, what an event. And I, I think, Jeff, you watched it as well, right? Yeah, I actually watched it this morning. <laughs> nice. Cool. Um, we did that event for everybody else, and I feel like I got more out of it than <laughs> Same. anybody could. Let's go around the, the table, and, and Jeff, you're welcome to jump in on this, too, if you have one. Um, but I'd love to hear what your favorite thing that Professor Reese talked about the other night uh, was. Anybody want, anybody want to start? I'll go. Um, Do it. My, one of my favorite things he said was talking about, it was the last piece of advice he gave at the end, and it's just talking about knowing your source material inside and out. And I feel like that's something that like is really, really important for the arranger side of things. And that was our focus of the night. But I think there's a lot of application to that outside of the arranging arena. Like when you're creating like a color guard show or you're trying to create the, like the visual design for a program, like knowing the music, that source material inside and out can make a big difference in how you interpret it and how you show it. So that was a great, great piece of advice. For sure. Absolutely. When uh, not only was the content, like how he was just saying with the advice he gave is so great, but also he was just, um, the thing I enjoyed probably the most about Professor Reese was um, how personable and friendly and fun and just how you can tell he does this for the right reasons, a humanistic approach. And you can't always, you don't always find that. So when you find someone who's not only just great at what they do, but they're also just a great person, it's really fun to talk to. I learned a lot. Um, one interesting thing uh, I liked a lot was when we kind of talked about the percussion and how that kind of works. Um, we talked about that with Professor Reese yesterday. So we're going to dive into that some more tonight as well. Um, anyone else have one or two things? Uh, I'll jump in. It's a small one, but it's really reframed the way that I see marching band shows. When he talked about how marching band shows are just Sonata Allegro form, it blew mm -hmm. my mind. <laughs> like, right. I, I mean, when I really, <sighs> the whole idea of the form of a marching band show made sense to me, but when he said Sonata Allegro, it just, it blew my mind. I was like, of course, right. that makes so much sense. So yeah, small development for me. Yeah. Jeff, you, you checked it out. Do you see anything? Yeah. Do you have anything? So again, with what you guys were saying with learning every part of an arrangement that you want to do, um, just really getting in there like nitty gritty. Um, I was actually going to talk about the same thing with percussion because like so much of what we do is physical. Um, and it's really easy as you're just staring at the notes on the page to say, oh, that should work. No problem. 
but especially with um, quads, tenors, whatever you say, and mallet percussion, there's some stuff that just straight up does not work. Um, you can have the Blue Devils play it and it just, it wouldn't happen. So um, something I really try to do is go through every part and make sure that everything at least makes sense. If I don't have the instrument in front of me, like um, I try to just like air drum it, I look like a goofball, but like, it doesn't matter. Like as long as the part works, then that's a huge thing. Cause the last thing I want is, you know, someone that's new to their instrument trying to read something and being like, I don't know how this is possible. So I, I really, really like that approach. Um, and it's something I'm definitely gonna try going forward with my arrangements. That's awesome. To, um, you know, tonight it's gonna be Jeff and Mike, you know, this is, this is your domain. Um, and, and just to catch everybody up, if anybody's tuning in for the first time, uh, what you're seeing is design details. We've taken one show and um, we're gonna start, we've started at the beginning of the planning process. Last week we saw Mike's uh, wins arrangement and what he does for this piece. Today we're gonna jump into the percussion side that Jeff is writing for this show. Uh, he's gonna talk about his process. Um, yeah, I feel like a broken record saying this every <clears> week, <throat> but I think it's such a great thing to just point out like, this is a process. This isn't the only process that can get you there. What I'm hoping is that by watching this, you can improve your process by stealing some of the ideas that you hear tonight. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Absolutely. Um, and I think that um, we're, Jeff, you already started kind of getting us there when you started to talk about kind of what you gathered from last night and, and kind of what you do. So we're, we're going to kind of go down that route for just a few minutes. Um, there's so much about percussion. <laughs> there's so much about percussion that I think a lot of people don't always know. Um, you know, as someone who's been doing band for, you know, almost 20 years now, you know, from middle school on, I still get amazed by how much I don't know about percussion. And so I suspect that there's a lot of things we might have to ask. Um, my first one to kind of get us going, I just said, just a general question for you is, um, for you as a percussion arranger, what is your preference on how you even get the process started? Like, do you prefer having a wind book done? Do you prefer being able to sketch ideas? Like, just what, what, where do you start and, and what do you like? So, really, my process, whether I'm writing the wind book or writing from someone else's wind book, is pretty much the same. I start with the wind book um, because that's what, I mean, the majority of people are going to be listening to anyway. So, you want that to be dialed in. Um, from there, um, my approach is honestly pretty improvis improvisatory. Um, I have a drum pad right over here that, you know, the first thing I did when you sent the wind book over was I'd listen to it through, it through it once and then grabbed my pad and just kind of played along with it. You know, just hacked. I didn't play anything great, but like what works where, what feels good where, like just trying to find out what works. So um, that's where I start. Um, I'm a battery person primarily. Um, so I usually start with the battery, but we'll see. I mean, in movement three, especially I, I wrote the entire pit book before I even started the battery. Um, so it's really finding out what parts of the show deserve attention from what sections really. Um, and from there, it's just kind of finding, you know, hit points, like finding a letter that is clearly a full ensemble moment, finding out what I want there and then finding out, okay, how do I get into this from here? And then how do I get out of it? and then repeat for the whole thing. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. Uh, do, do you ever, so if you, so if you get a full show, if you get a full movement of two minutes, so two minute opener, do you start at the beginning and go to the end or do you actually like sketch things out as you hear them? Or like, is it jumping, you jump around or is it, how does that work? I usually jump around. Um, I think movement two, um, I had a, as we were talking about before, I had a pretty strong idea of what, what I wanted to hear at the beginning. So I just kind of jumped at it and that pretty much went front to back. Um, but for movement one, um, I'm looking at it now, I forget where I started, but it was toward the middle that I had a really, really strong idea. I was like, okay, I want to get this down before I forget it <laughs> and um, just make sure this is in there and then go back to the other parts that uh, I maybe didn't have as strong of an idea and I just kind of repeat it until something pops into my head. I, I heard the phrase before, good ideas spawn good ideas. So if you're able to start in a section and get something good going, usually 
you have some connecting material that gets you to get into it or out of it. Is that something you find to happen from percussion, either from a rhythmic standpoint or even just a melodic standpoint? Absolutely. Um, I try in my, in my battery writing, especially, I try to be as melodic as possible. So if there's a really strong um, like melodic motif, I try to like kind of mold that into the tenor or bass voices. Um, and some ways in the snares too, uh, there's a couple spots we can check out with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, especially rhythmic motifs, again, in movement two, we'll see that, um, there's a couple really strong rhythmic motifs that just keep popping up and, um, you know, it'd be, I'd be kind of stupid to miss those, you know? Well, the, and those are just my first initial questions, Jordan and Holly, I'm really excited to hear if you guys have any as well, because uh, for, for me, it's just so interesting because when we do the wind book, there's nothing that exists, right? And so that that process for me is kind of a nightmare sometimes. And a lot of times the, the content's created by like the storyline and what I feel best with like the plot. And so it jumps around. So it's always been interesting, like with a percussion arranger, you see the roadmap, you know, the musical roadmap. So it's always interesting to see what happens. Um, Jordan and Holly, do you do you guys have any initial questions about just kind of the percussion process or just percussion writing in general? I do. Um, this is definitely not in my wheelhouse, percussion writing and percussion. Um, but I think, you know, having listened to enough shows over the year, I can tell, you know, some of the great things that make great percussion is the same as, you know, the rest of music, right? So <laughs> one thing I've noticed about percussion writing in the groups that I've worked with is that it seems to be a lot more customized than a wind book. Um, there tends to be a lot more customization. How do you go about that, especially with groups that you have a little bit less contact with? I actually enjoy that a lot. So um, as I'm writing for groups that I teach, I like I really emphasize that, you know, I'm not writing this for vibraphone two. I'm writing this for Ray. Mm -hmm. You know, I know exactly what Ray can do. I know what he can't do. I know what he probably could do by the end of band camp and stuff like that. Um, so that makes my life a lot easier. Um, when I'm writing for groups that I don't teach, I try to have a bit of the same approach, you know, put someone right in the middle of the road. Um, I like talking to the other percussion directors too. Mm -hmm. And just kind of, you know, throwing some things out there. It's like, hey, what do you think about flam fives and stuff like that? Like, you know, one out of five. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> The book. Um, you know, there's there's some stuff that you know anyone in high school should be able to play. Um, there's there's some stuff that you know the the kids that are taking lessons and like you know maybe doing an indoor drum line or something like that will be able to play. Um, but you also have to write for the kids that are just there. I don't I don't want to say just for fun, but like aren't as like super super into it as right. the other kids. So, yeah, it really, really helps to know who you're writing for. So that, that's one of my big things. I mean, when, when we first started this project, the first thing I said to Mike was like, I need to get in touch with the percussion director right. just to make sure we're on the same page. And that's exactly, so part, and that's part of my job is like, I view my job as being a coordinator in many ways and a facilitator. So it, it depends where the, where the, I don't want to say the, the contract or the point of contact kind of happens. But with this show in particular, with working with Rick Paget and Ryan Dredger and Zoom Old East, um, shout out to those guys. I think they're viewing in again tonight. So, hey, guys, um, thanks for checking out. I heard uh, you guys, some of the parents and students tuned into our last one. So that's really cool. Um, but when they were working on this, it was, it, was, it was literally the first thing Jeff asked. Was once we confirmed that Jeff was arranging the percussion book and we got all the details locked in, Jeff said, can we get in contact with Ryan, the percussion director? I need to know the exact people and all that. And so, um, like, at that point, my job is to micromanage that process because I trust Jeff. The only thing he needs right. from me is to make sure we get that connect. I think we email, and that email, I, I'm pretty sure, and, and Jeff or Ryan, if you're tuning in, you can correct it, but I'm pretty sure in that first email, he set up a thread and said, you two can just eliminate me from here and out and just do your thing because you're going to talk about stuff I have no idea. Uh, <laughs> but... <laughs> But like paradiddle riddle riddle like no I'm sorry but but uh, but but I think that's really Jordan I think I think what you're asking is pretty awesome in, in the sense of um, kind of kind of where we just came from you know um, 
Yeah, you know, it's funny. The more we do this, the more we have these conversations, the more I realize that everything's really connected and everything's very different and kind of the same. Like you talking about, um, Jeff, you talking about connecting with the percussion instructor. One of the first things I always do, um, I did this at your band camp, Mike. I don't know if you remember this or not, but we had a staff meeting. And then the mm -hmm. very next thing I did is said, hey, I need to talk to Jimmy, the color guard director. Yeah, that's what that we did. the yeah. first person I need to talk about. And those are the conversations I'm having. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'm going to piggyback off that because this is really important. Uh, uh, Jeff and, and, and Jordan and myself, uh, Jeff is our percussion director. Jordan writes a drill for, for my own, for our, the, the college program, the Notre Dame College. And so we know each other really well. We know Holly really well because we worked with her and, and like in every aspect, like teaching over the summers the past few years. So like we have a connection of trust here. And so I think kind of something that Professor Reese even mentioned yesterday was like that inner circle of trust people you trust. When you start getting that, I have found that like with Jeff, I, I, I really trust with what he writes and I know that he's going to deliver what I'm looking for because we've worked together for years. So it's kind of like an internal trust. Um, I, I find that relationship as a staff member really important with each other, but I think that's kind of to go off what you kind of, you two were just talking about writing specifically for your students. I, I feel like that's a connection you kind of make by writing for your students specifically too. You're not really writing for where they are. You're kind of writing for where they can grow into. Because you're the only one who right. knows that. So you're trying to write for future, uh, what was the name you said, Ray? You're trying to write for future Ray in three months. Because that's going to make that person better. And you know that. So I feel that way with kind of the staff process too. Is like there has to be a level of trust where you allow the person to be themselves, but still be successful. Um, so, so that's just kind of my two cents. Holly, do you have anything to... Uh, yeah, totally. Um, I say I agree with everything everyone said so far. Um, but it's the idea every everybody I've worked with is always like if they can do it at band camp, it's not good. Because if they can do it at band camp, then they don't spend three months learning. They spend three months getting really good at something they could already do. So I totally hate that. that. And it's interesting. This is way way earlier in what Jeff was saying but just talking about how doesn't always start at the beginning and that's just like the exact process I do when I'm like writing choreography so I find a part where I'm where I like hear something and I feel something and it's like okay I'm gonna start here and then you know get the big moments and then at some point I connect the pieces so it was cool hearing that that's the same yeah you have to thanks you yeah. It's just a slog if you don't. Yeah. Um, Dude, go, ahead. go ahead, Jeff. Something that I saw um, in an interview with Scott Johnson, the guy at Blue Devils, the percussion guy, he said the same thing. Um, you know, if, if, they're, if they're nailing the snare feature at the end of move-ins, it's not hard enough. Right. Like, what are we working on the rest of the summer? <laughs> I'm already killing it. In the so, yeah, I thought that was really interesting. I'm thinking of his level of scope of difficulty when it comes to that. And I'm thinking <laughs> yeah. of like 16th notes on my trombone. And you're like, oh my God. And they're like, I know that's like nothing <laughs> for them. They're like, yeah, I can just, you know, sight read. That's like eating their Wheaties. Um, very, very cool. You know, uh, I have a random question before we go into kind of this next area. Jeff's going to break down the music here soon. And I'm really excited for that. Um, one last question for Holly and kind of Jeff. Like, uh, Holly, I know sometimes. Uh, with with my own color guard students, something they've told me is they love um, that, that they really listen for like a lot of times the wind parts, like in the recordings, mm -hmm. um, and they don't always hear the drum parts. Or does when you're chore when you're doing choreography or teaching, um, are there moments that are definitely inspired by those percussion parts for you that that make you think of tech? Like, do certain textures make you think of equipment or certain things like that? Um, it depends on if when I'm choreographing, the percussion part is in the MIDI file, because uh, that, I mean, if you don't have the part, you, what don't, do you, do? you can't write yeah. to it, but there's, there's some parts where, I know I've written to a lot of percussion features, and that's a really important, like, you gotta <laughs> listen to that, and I don't right. know, I think it just depends on the show and moments that happen, and if there's like a, I mean, there's tosses on big drum hits and, you know, catches on a little thing in the pit. Like, right. <laughs> the triangle. It's, it, I think it just depends 
on the show and what's what makes the most sense, I guess. I, I, I'll tell you this, from a choreographing band moments, right, which is something that I was very new to four or five years ago, but actually doing the choreo choreography there, obviously really different than going guard choreography for a myriad <laughs> of reasons. But when I realized I could look down to the bottom of the score and look for the accents and the, and the battery parts, it changed my life. Like that, that is a great hint for anybody who wants to take that home. If you're choreographing, just look at the accents and the percussion part. And that's a good way to, to get an idea of where to go. The score is a great tool for figuring out the stuff that's really hard to figure out just by listening. If you were in band and read that sheet music, life is a lot easier. Um, How about that? One, one random just yes or no, basically. Holly, have you ever in your time had to work directly with the percussion director in the design process? Like directly? Not as a per, like not as a director director or a coach but there was one season with with jay actually P P professor reese he had the palm line and the twirlers play tambourines in our in a beatles show so gotcha. like there was like a design thing that combined all those people so i think that you, that would be a moment that i would think of yeah very uh, unique effect and flip that jeff have you, as a percussion arranger, usually work the music, the band director or the music arranger, have you ever um, worked directly with the color guard in choreography, in choreography for anything that you've done? Quite a bit. Um, so yeah, our, our process at South involves pretty much the entire staff um, at all meetings all the time. So um, there's actually been a lot of really good input from our guard person um, about, you know, we could have certain choreography here. Actually, our show two years ago started with, with the battery in the guard, like doing partner work, which, cool. you know, you told me that in high school. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, she's a huge part of the design process from day one for sure. And Very I, I cool. Because she, she brings different things that I would not think about. Because I don't, I don't have that brain. Um, right. I'm, I'm all paradiddles and flam drags. That's, that's all I have. But, like, uh, but knowing that there could be a visual element to what I'm doing really helps me kind of think outside the box with what I'm doing. Like, is it really a good idea to just be ramming double strokes over your head this whole time? Like when there's probably going to be body here. So, right. It's kind of that I've heard uh, the term kind of orchestral percussion writing for the field. Things that are, things that are tasteful, make sense, delicate. From what I can tell, that kind of fits the style of what you do a lot. Um, um, that actually is a huge part of what I do. Um, our cool. approach at Legends, if anyone's familiar with our approach there, is very orchestral. Um, you know, at, at certain points, playing a literal, like, copy and paste of the original snare part from the piece we're playing. Um, I think that my style is a combination of that and a more uh, kind of drum course style where things are a little bit more rammy. So I, I think there's a time and place I, I can show you when we get into the music, but there's a time and place for both. Um, well, we want to know those things because it's, it's fascinating because I don't think a lot of people, it took me many years to realize that there was even a difference, right? And so yeah. um, on the field. And so I, I think it's really cool. And I, I think it's time. I think we should start checking that out because I'm excited to see because I, uh, I know you have some music to show us, right? So the percussion, the percussion music for the Wizard of Oz show. So can, can you, di let's dive into that. Let's start diving into the part one. And can you show us kind of what you're even just talking about by, by just, what do you mean by orchestral? Um, there's a better spot in part two. Cool, that'd be great. Since we're on it. Um, let's see. We still here? Yep. I, I, yep. We, we got the video. Cool. So um, we'll do a big playthrough here in a minute, but parts two, part two starts uh, pretty loud, pretty aggressive. And then after all that's done, we go to kind of a more mellow, more major section. Um, mm -hmm. So what I'll do is I'll play like the last bar or so of that and then um, you'll hear the transition to more concert playing. 
Here we go. Yeah, so we started super and marching band on the 50-yard line territory. But as things got lighter, you can see here, um, I'll zoom in. Um, I have the snares playing with concert sticks if they want. If they don't, that's fine too. Um, just to lighten up the mood a little bit. You know, there's, if we go up in the score here, there's a woodwind feature. Um, so, granted, they're all writing forte. But as you guys talked about in the last episode, um, forte is not necessarily forte all the time. So um, we really want, want to make sure that we're not overpowering the woodwinds there. So that's definitely more of a concert approach, right? So we're not thinking, hey, check me out. Uh, I'm playing some cool stickings here. Like, that's what everyone cares about. No, they care about the woodwind feature. So we want to stay out of the way of that and just make sure that we're contributing something that is actually adding and not subtracting from the overall effect. And, 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 and are you cool if I ask you a question or two? Sure. All right, sweet. Uh, so you make the choice here to use that snare drum during the woman part, right? Mm -hmm. um, and is there a reason, I, I love it, by the way. I love the, I love the texture here. Um, what, is there a reason you choose snare drum as opposed to like the quads or bass or a different texture? Or do you hear that for like a pulse control thing? Um, like why in particular that instrument for, from an orchestral standpoint? Actually, great question. Um, so if you look at the score, um, I don't want to zoom out too far so you can actually see what's going on. Um, so we start in the woodwinds and then go to more of a bass and tenor voice and then add uh, trumpets over here. So really what I'm trying to do is mimic the voice of the, uh, the wind group that's being featured. So I want them to fit into the texture um, and not stick out of it too much. We have the best chance of doing that if the uh, the range and timbre are pretty similar. Yeah, that kind of blows my mind. Are there any times you choose to break that rule? Um, sometimes. Um, I can't really I can't really think of a, a spot here. Sure. Um, but you know, if if I have a really cool idea for like a quad feature or something. Mm -hmm. I just kind of put my foot down. I was like, no, this is a quad. <laughs> okay. Uh, if, you know, if I'm playing by the book, that's, that's how I do it. Cool. That's, that's well, great info. And, and certain sounds, I, I'm assuming certain sounds play into other sounds. Like you were saying the texture, like with the snare drum and, 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 and the woodwinds. Um, later on in this movement, you even have a spot where it's like the low brass and bass drums. Yeah. Which happens right it, here. Right, right, right. When they have the melody. So here's a question for you: Is that when you when you build a texture like low brass with bass drums, that becomes part of your tool belt that you can like that orchestration is something you can use. Is that something like once you find something like that in the show you like? Is that something you find yourself coming back to a lot in that show? Um, maybe not consciously, but I feel like it okay. does a lot. Um, it's just one of those things that just kind of works. And if you find something that works that well, why change it? Um, yeah. That's the thing that, you know, I feel like a lot of people forget, and I forget sometimes too, is that you're not playing to someone that's right in front of the ensemble. You're playing to someone that is, you know, 50, 60, 100 feet off the ground and, you know, however many yards back because of the stands. You have to make sure that the sounds you're using actually translate that far away. Um, so if right. you're throwing instrumentation then you're just making it muddy and um, it's just going to be really hard to translate that far away. Now, sometimes it's, uh, this is going to be more of a logistical thing, but I know sometimes it's not always even, um, it's not even the orchestration that sometimes does it. It's sometimes mechanical things like microphones and what you're using to project your front ensemble or your, your pit. So um, like, 
pretty early on about 10 years ago when I was first doing marching shows and we were starting to do amplifications a little bit more, um, like in 2010, um, one of the things we kept, we couldn't figure out like, why did our, what was a back, we actually tried out a back ensemble that year, but we couldn't figure out why we just didn't sound good. And it turned out that we had our microphones up too close to the instruments. So we were just getting attack and that reverb or like resonance. And like, do you find those things happening a lot with like, um, like, is it, are, do you find those problems happening more and more? Or are most people pretty aware of those things? And do you take a, those things into consideration? Um, I think most people have figured it out at this point, if they're going to figure it out. Uh, <laughs> I, people don't even use mics because it, it rains six days out of the week here and it's really not worth it most of the time. <laughs> um, but I, I think they're a great tool. Uh, honestly, like I said, if, if budget wasn't a concern and it didn't rain so much, it would definitely, <laughs> but, um, well, very cool. I, Jeff, um, th th thanks for humoring me in the orchestral question that I threw out of nowhere. Um, I appreciate it a lot as, as someone who, you know, orchestral music, I just, I absolutely love. And so it's fun to hear that influence on a very different world being you know something that influences you here um can we yeah i just remembered um so i think it's really important to make sure that your drumline kids are not one-dimensional players in that they are not lost when they walk up to a concert snare drum you know they can jazz run while playing triplet rolls all day but as soon as they see like a rat cue, they're just like what <laughs> Or like a note with more than two P's under it. Like it just doesn't compute. So I really like tying more orchestral elements into my battery books just to make sure that stuff is keeping in check. Um, Cause I know a lot of schools don't have concert band uh, during marching season. So those skill sets are not practiced at all unless they're in practice or in, um, private lessons. So yeah, I think it's really, really important both for, like a compositional standpoint and an educational standpoint to make sure that, you know, the battery is actually playing dynamics and playing with a good touch and making sure they're not playing too heavy or modifying your feel depending on what the book calls for. When, when you mentioned the two P's, it doesn't compute, compute. I, I thought you were talking about little brass players for a second. <laughs> um, uh, beautiful. Um, no, we know that we know we love percussionists, but we know who you are. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the farther Jeff, back in the room you get, the less yeah. likely people are to understand soft dynamics. Yeah, I play too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's it's um I, the the most dangerous thing I've ever seen um ever in my life. Uh, this is kind of a you know the, probably the most scary thing is uh, back in Missouri our band room was we went pretty far back and our percussionists were back there, but then we had these other like our practice rooms were right behind where they would normally stand. So you know where they would always want to go and hang out and be goofy and spill their soda and scream profane things. Um, so um, I shall not repeat. Okay. <laughs> so um, Jeff, thanks so much for humoring, hu like showing us that orchestral example. Um, uh, could you, could you take us back into part one so we can kind of start back? Sure. from within there and kind of go into the show a little bit and just kind of if you want to play the full thing or just break it down but um basically last week we showed the wind book for um as jordan said earlier the wind book for the show so jeff has all of um jeff has part one two and three done for the uh uh battery and pit and so we're really excited to hear kind of uh the, the music and talk about it so jeff thanks for pulling it up take it away uh, I'm just going to mute my mic and play part one real quick, then we'll go through it. Cool.
cool. That is movement one. Um, going back to the beginning here. Um, so in this very beginning, there's going to be some samples, some voiceover, stuff like that. So I didn't want to be too busy here. But uh, one thing of note is the kind of out of key uh, reference to Somewhere Over the Rainbow, kind of just letting you know what we're getting ourselves into here um, in this right here. So that'll perk up a couple of years in the audience, just kind of like, okay, I see where we're going with this. Um, so from there, um, as you can see, I mean, the, the score thickens up pretty fast. Um, so we'll just play this section here real quick. So for the most part, um, these are unison, but um, specifically in the battery here, we kind of layer these attacks, just kind of introducing the sounds. So we have a unison attack here. Bass drum sound is super goofy, sorry. Um, but just kind of putting momentum into the um, show a little bit. We have... Um, Xylos and Marimba is doing most of the work here. Um, again, staying in that six tuplet um, subdivision. And Vibes, join us here for a second. Um, just play the full percussion score here for a second. Just a general housekeeping thing that I really try to do. Um, it doesn't always work out, but um, if you have the same, at least the same subdivision going on, meaning if someone's playing a triplet, that means most of the percussion ensemble is playing triplets. Otherwise, it gets muddy and it just doesn't translate to the box very well. Um, so you see here, like anytime I have six tuplets in the mallet runs, someone up here is playing a sextuplet or a triplet. It's making sure they're uh, fitting mm -hmm. in the texture there. Um, and then as soon as they go to 16th notes, the battery goes to a more duple feel. Um, uh, can I interject for just a second? There? Jeff, can, is that a cool? Yeah. I, I, you're kind of already blowing my mind um, in the sense of like just talking about the, the rhythmic structure because I, I think that I think that the contrast, we think of contrast a lot as like dynamics and orchestration and whatnot, right? But a lot of us don't think of contrast between a da 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 like when you have those triplets for like a, a, a two, a, you know, three verse two, right? And like how that goes from beat to beat. So it creates a pretty uneasy type of feeling. It feels like momentum, right? And so like you're already kind of talking about a different kind of contrast that we haven't talked about yet in the show. Um, like on, on design details is, is, is kind of just altering that small little idea creates a huge a huge moment or a lot of material for you to work with yeah so it, it's a small detail that you know at, as we all know in the design process the whole thing is small details so the more the more small details we have right they just add up and the whole thing just kind of sorts itself out we did not hire jeff to be a spokesperson for us <laughs> but you probably have a good idea of why this show is called details <laughs> design details right it, it, it because it is all i've always thought of it this way jeff tell me if you think if if this has some merit but i've always thought that um one individual small detail doesn't always matter but when you start adding up five small details and 10 and 15 and 20 notes of small details that that is what a big moment is yeah a big moment a creative great moment are the details I'm assuming that's true for percussion, like you just said. 100%. Um, my, my favorite small detail, um, you can probably see it from here, even zoomed out this far, is I am so particular about stickings. Mm -hmm. um, again, mm. let, let's say that there's a freshman on the snare line, and they've only been reading eighth grade rep so far, which really doesn't have any stickings written in it unless you're lucky. Um, 
they're going to see these rhythms and be like, what is going on? So like at least giving them enough information to know what hand goes where is goes so far. Um, as I was talking about earlier with quads too, you know, certain round, certain around patterns work with certain stickings and it just doesn't work otherwise. So like, um, I'm trying to think of an example here through the quad part. Um, yeah, if I change the sticking here in these two bars, it, it's very mm -hmm. that impossible. So like, you always kind of have to plan for, you know, someone not understanding what you're going for and then picking something that you didn't intend. Um, so I try to take all the guesswork out of it and just say, hey, this is what I had in mind. Um, you're free to change it if you want, but this is how it works best. Right. I, I assume you probably think of timpani a little bit when you write for quads or tenors or if that relationship happens. Yeah, a little bit. Um, it's definitely similar in the way you get around the drums. Right. That's what I, yeah, right. That um, concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Do you write for timpani ever anymore? Is that a thing that you ever do? Never written for timpani. <laughs> Is that um, a dream? Oh, I'd love to. Um, <laughs> or a nightmare. <laughs> I've played so much timpani and I've never written for it. I just realized that actually. Uh, you're going to put a timpani in our field, put all four drums out there, but only give them a B flat and F and see what happens. Give them that one five. Um, <laughs> came out for this. Um, it's gonna be like a monkey's paw situation. Like you're gonna write for timpani, but it's gonna be like four dudes marching. With the actual timpani on their back. Have you you watch those old? I'm sure you've seen them. The old marching timpani. Oh yeah. Back, I love those things. Yeah. <laughs> Why would those um, exist? I'll tell you the one that blows my mind. Well, in drum corps, things, they do. Everything had to be marched at one point, but the. Uh, the chimes were the most amazing to me. The people with like the, looked like they had scoliosis with the chimes on the front of them. Like, go check that out. That's okay. mm. We, I, some might say that we've progressed since 1970, but I don't know. That was before harnesses were comfortable. So like yeah. they didn't have these like pieces of plastic bolted together. Like now we have this like space <laughs> enough that like, you know, pushes on your back just the right way. And like, you know, is like airlift and stuff like that. And now back then it was like, here's a piece of sheet metal and a couple bolts, figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I was going to say. It's funny you say that because I can totally imagine that most band directors were like, all right, I got, I got a random tool shed over here by the school. Like, what the hell do, well, like, what can we use here? Like, let's just do it. Yeah, right. Because I, I mean, knowing, knowing most of them, that's like a thing we probably would, wouldn't think about until like the very end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um. Jeff, can I ask you a question here about the score? I, I, this is something you, you, you brought to my attention. So uh, uh, in the process of arranging part one, Jeff brought to my attention a really cool orchestration moment in the marimbas. Um, oh, yeah. um, and I think that, if you don't mind, could you just show us that kind of moment and break that down a little bit? Sure. So, Mike, as you were saying earlier, um, for those of you that don't know, he, he puts a piano part into the score, just like a, hey – here's my general idea for the pit part here. You know, obviously do whatever you want with it, but this is what I had in my head. Um, so he had actually the xylophone part here. Um, mm -hmm. Right, the running 16s. That. And um, something I, I really believe in when I'm writing is that I want whoever gets the part to be excited to play it. Um, so I don't want them to like dread of like, uh, what rehearsal is this uh oh man letter j like can we just skip letter j like that's the last thing i want so like i was like okay i really like how this part sounds underneath the wind parts here but how can i spice this up a little bit so um we have a little bit of craziness here uh, <laughs> but um as you can see here 16th notes are at the written dynamic mezzo piano eighth notes are at piano so basically, say what you got to say with the 16th notes, and then get out of the way. So if we look down the score, beat one, marimba one, it's playing this. Beat two, marimba two. Beat three, marimba three. And that cycles throughout this entire rehearsal letter, actually two. Um, so what you get is the same kind of um, 16th note run, but there's only one player actually playing it at a time. So it sounds like this. Thank you. 
something to note as well is that we have a quarter note pulse of the tonic of the chord. Um, so we just kind of have that driving feel to it. Um, so it actually gave me a pretty cool opportunity to have the 16th note run and also have that six, uh, quarter note pulse at the same time from the same players. I think you're muted, Mike. Yeah, Mike, you're muted. <laughs> Slide. Um, <Yeah. laughs> uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to give. <laughs> That's how I usually talk to my band. They have no idea what I'm ever saying. Um, I, how everyone did? No. Um, so, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, I, I'm going to give some props here. And that is, and to me, that this is some of the best. This is some of the coolest front ensemble and probably the smartest front ensemble writing I've, I've worked with with any arrangers I've done um, in, in the percussion world. And I, and I say that, that I want to specifically make sure we talk about this because it, it doesn't, you don't hear it as well in the playback because it's MIDI, but you're going to hear those eighth notes and the tonic, like you mentioned, a lot more. And the texture of what you created is very film score esque. Um, like it, it has a very much like a movie type of feel. And so, um, which was kind of the goal here, because this is when the narration starts to introduce the character. So this is some of the most programmatic type music we need. So it's very much like that. So it's interesting to see the kind of that approach here, because I felt as though it was like almost watching if someone was doing a vamp section in like Wizard of Oz, like and they were doing narration. It's almost what I got the impression. Here. So it's a really cool moment, and it's going to be really beautiful in the field. I think that's some of the best orchestration I've seen. I like in front ensemble writing. I just love it. Thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to see it too. I'm excited to see it work. And hear it. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'm going to be asking for Bandcamp videos. Watch out for that. Um, cool. Um, so moving on, again, we kind of have these, um, I'm looking at just the progression score here. Let me open it up. Um, I wins. Um, so as we have these solos bouncing around, we have the battery adding back in and kind of trickling out. Um, we'll play this section here. Uh, speaking of idiom idiomatic parts, before we go on, um, you know, we're off to see the wizard. I have a marching pattern in the concert snare here. Again, Sibelius playback, but you get the idea. Um, it's just the little details like that that, you know, not everyone might catch, but the people that do are going to be like, that was cool. That ties together everything we're trying to do. And I, I'm a pretty big believer that even if someone doesn't catch it, they still know it's there and they would notice if it wasn't. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Totally so, agree with that. Well, uh, and, and the fun part about that little section you're talking about, Jeff, is that the whole thing is kind of meant to be around that texture idea of like um, well, the characters are introduced here, right? We have the Tin Man and, and uh, I'm sorry, the Scarecrow, Tin Man, the Lion. So what the orchestration of the wind parts match that uh, when you think of hay, mellophone is lighter in texture, like hay is Scarecrow. And then you think of metal being a little bit more intense and then you think of lion being like this, the clarinet being higher. So like, we're trying to orchestrate this texture of the narration in there. And that's something that I'm seeing with those battery parts as well. And that's really fun because like, then that's a comprehensive product. Like the narration that's going to go in there isn't just going to make sense musically, but it's also going to help Jordan visually. Right. I mean, Jordan, I mean, I imagine that like hearing what we're talking about now, I'm assuming it's going to help inform you with ideas. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I don't even really have that much to say about it. It just, yeah. When, <laughs> Um, you know, what's, what was really cool, um, what, what was really cool was, you know, hearing your part originally, Mike, when you originally wrote this, there were some, some gaps in my brain uh, mm -hmm. seeing through these things, especially the beginning, right? Um, we knew that it was going to be percussion heavy and we didn't really know. So I was like, okay. I'll you mean my out. one G minor chord to <laughs> right. help you out? What the heck? Not, not particularly. I mean, the cool. beginning really did transform. Yeah. It's, it's awesome. Yeah. For sure. It's so much more clear now. Uh, sound yeah. Effect. And, and that's just trust. So the cool thing about this, and this is a side note to kind of the people, anyone tuning in and, 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 and anyone in a younger team, but the, but the cool thing here is that like, there's a trust. So like Jeff and I have worked together more than Jeff and Jordan have, but now Jeff 
and Jordan are getting a sense of how they work. Right. And vice versa. So there's a there's a team here. And like as we get like color guard and our color guard, like Holly, and we get them choreographing and working with us more. There's a sense of like we like I know like, I wasn't concerned. If you would have told me a week ago, Jordan, that you weren't fully sure, I would have like, no worries, just wait right. till Jeff gives it to you. Because right. I just he's he's good at what he does. So that's the cool part of that. So I'm I'm excited to see where that kind of goes over the next few years because I have a feeling that this process is gonna come like just be like, all right, yeah, this is how we do it. I'm excited. Um, Jeff, the counter, uh, uh, the counter route part one, and, and unless you have something I'm, I'm completely missing, you kind of go completely crazy and have a lot of fun in part two. Yeah, part two is a riot. Real quick, Jordan, you were saying earlier, if there's ever a time I go against um, the battery correlating to wind parts, mm-hmm. you probably did it right here. I just oh, add I to... um, It's just what I thought sounded best at the time. So it's really situational. Um, oh yeah, just having all those things in my toolbox like really, really helps. So yeah, that's all I had for that. Cool. That's cool though. I think it's great. I think I, uh, it's important that people realize percussionists deserve to know the word orchestration, and <laughs> uh, because it's it's just so important. And the the books that drive me the craziest, and I say this respectfully because everyone has different tastes. But for me, the one that's the hardest for me to get involved sometimes are the ones where they're just hammering out. So it's yep. nice to see these texture changes. I really enjoy it. And we really have no excuse because we have the most options. <laughs> Good point. Fair. Yeah. Yeah. Basically unlimited options. Like I've seen yeah. lines play on car mufflers before. Like, <laughs> <I'm all right. laughs> cool. um, so that's part one, right? So we get... So we're gonna show a bit of we're gonna show part two now too. Um, Jeff goes a little bit crazier here in part two, which makes sense with the music you're gonna hear and just the plot in general. But Jeff, I feel like uh, from the get go here, you really just kind of unleash the demons. So um, let's let's go through part two. Take us through it. What, what what's this all about? Cool. Um, yeah. So things get pretty crazy here. Um, so we we talked a little bit before about having you know, uh, a battery focus or a front ensemble focus or a certain instrument focus and movements. This whole movement is very much a battery focus. It doesn't mean a battery feature, but they're just prominent in the orchestration. Mm-hmm. Other than it. It's just kind of filling in the gaps and the opposite is true in movement three. Um, so that being said, um, again, let's just listen through this and uh, see you at the end. <laughs> So uh, a sweet and gentle little bonbon, right? Um, uh, just <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jeff, uh, where do we begin on this? Uh, take take us through like what what is the main purpose here? Like what 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 what's going on in your mind when you're approaching a movement like this? So again, um, 
the first thing I do when I get a score is one, just play through it, just listening. Honestly, I really don't even look at the score that much the first time through. Um, just listening to what's going on. Second time, I grab my pad and just kind of see what happens. Um, I honestly, you'd be surprised how often what I play ends up in the score. Um, not because it maybe sounds the best, but because it what feels most natural. Obviously, if it's like really dumb, I don't leave it. But, um, <laughs> no, I, I'm I'm really for things feeling and sounding good equally. Um, so. If there's one thing a drumline is really good at, it's playing aggressively. Uh, I don't think I've ever met a drumline that didn't like hitting the drum. So, <laughs> uh, before, you know, there's definitely a time and place for a concert approach, but there's also a time and place to kind of have some fun. So um, that's what this whole opening feature is. Not really a feature, but um, just a couple like editorial notes um, here. I was talking about stickings before. Um, these first four eighth notes here, I have it, I could have very easily just made it right, left, right, left, right. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been perfect, fine. No one really would have been able to tell the difference, like from the box especially. Um, I made it three rights and a left because it's more fun. It looks cooler. Um, so like the thing about battery writing and percussion writing in general is that there's more of a visual element to it. You can write whatever you want for a clarinet and it's gonna look basically the same. Um, but if you, you know, what sticking you use really affects how the drum line looks. You know, if I had this all off the right, it would look really, really strange. But, you know, this is just me as a, a drummer and drum corps nerd talking, but like, there's nothing better than standing in front of a drum line just ramming double strokes. I don't know, you can't beat it. <laughs> um, so, I've been on both sides, both wearing a drum and standing in front of a drum line. It's just like, this is the best. This is awesome. Um, so that's kind of where I was at here. We just need a, a lot of sound, not too much sound, but you know, enough to get our point across like, hey, something's happening. Um, so just the battery part here at the beginning. Yeah. We, Jeff, could you play that? I, at least on my end, I, I lost the audio that time a little bit. Same here. Can play you, that one more time. Can you do that one more time? Work that time. Still, it's still pretty soft on my it's end. Pretty quiet. Yeah. Sounds like something's washing it out. I think we'll be able to hear that on my side at least. Okay. That time. That was a little louder. Weird me. All right. Um, so, yeah, loud drums. Pretty much all you need to know. Um, in this, <laughs> we have this theme. And when I was playing quads a lot, one of my favorite things to do was just like figure out how to play different songs on them. So, I think quads are really underutilized for stuff like that. So um, I've kind of written this melody in the quads and then kind of gone off of it. So here's that. So again, that's just one of those things that, you know, not everyone in the, in the audience is going to notice, but um, I think you would notice it missing if it wasn't there. Um, Something else to note is that the marimbas are actually all playing three-part harmony here in dead strokes, just outlining the, um, the wind chords. Um, again, in that run, I, I air drum that and made sure it worked. Um, so there's a lot of different things that can go wrong in that if you're not careful. Um, but just again, details. Um, moving on, um, I'm gonna open it up to the wind score here too. Um, so we hear this kind of counterpoint here between the high winds and the low winds. I'll just play the winds here. Cool, 
So as a percussion designer, that's kind of a no-brainer, right? We have to do the same thing because if we did something else, it just wouldn't sound right. So um, here's the battery part for that. Yeah, Jeff, for whatever reason, whenever we're only doing battery, that's when the sound comes Yeah, the sound is just, yeah. Okay. Which um, is strange, because we can hear it like whenever the pit's in. I don't know. It's bizarre. Right. But still, you can see the score and notice that we're going um, snare drum, quads, snare drum, quads. Um, something I did in the bass drums is have top two play and then bottom three. Something mm -hmm. that I don't see very often is splitting up the bass line in kind of like a pseudo unison kind of fashion. Um, I do it a couple more times later in the movement. I'll show you that then. Um, but um, it's okay to only have two bass drums playing at the same time. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, so I think if we didn't have these top two bass drums here and then had them play unison here, it wouldn't have the same oomph because the bottom would just drop out on beats one and two. You don't want that. Um, here's an example of where I think if you played this, like the little drummer boy and just boop, 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 it would just kind of look goofy. So um, again, this is totally up to the drumline instructor, but I think this would be best if you really kind of lifted off of it and made sure that the audience knew what you were doing. Because um, I mean, you have to think that at least one person is watching the drumline at any given point. You want to give them something to look at too. So um, we've gone through this section before. A quick question for you, Jeff. Um, when you're writing the mallet parts, because like like so, and you, for folks who listened last week, you heard the piano sketches or and the synth parts, like the sketches, and and then Jeff, like you mentioned, he takes that and translates that out to the mallets and writes tons of extra things that never existed, right? And so, my question to you is, how do you know what? What what is it that goes in your head or makes you go from okay, I need to write a mallet part that's more melodic or more like uh, an effect, like a, a, a running running lines. You know what I mean? Does that make a little bit of sense, what I'm asking? Um, to be completely honest, it's pretty improvisatory again. <laughs> it's kind of whatever I feel is best in the moment. Um, but I think that if we're, I mean, this whole thing, you can look up and down the score. This is clearly going somewhere. Um, so the best way to go somewhere, in, on mallets at least, is a run. Um, it doesn't have to be a long run. Um, I mean, there's, there's more than a couple just two beat runs in here just to say, you know, just kind of push into the new phrase. Um, but for features, I mostly like having um, four voices in each marimba. Um, it just seems to thicken it up a little bit. Um, and I, again, I, I don't like when the bottom drops out when the percussion is only playing. Um, it, just, it just doesn't feel right. Um, so especially if your front ensemble is mic'd, um, having um, the the left hand playing some open fifths um, really adds a lot. It doesn't have to be fifths, but um, while I'm looking at it, something else to note is, um, you know, I have three marimba players. Um, for about 75% of the show, they're playing the same thing. Um, but there's also a lot of times where I have one or two of them playing an octave down from the other marimba player. Um, so let's see if we can hear this. Um, this is the just the marimba one part. Cool. Now, if we add in this marimba three part that's an octave down, you know it's a pretty big difference, hopefully. So again, just little stuff that adds up and um, doesn't take you out of the show just because there's, there might be like, you know, some bass voice missing. Mm -hmm. um, what, when you wrote that part, what part did you write first? Um, marimba, for sure. And then I, I kind of had, actually, I think this is the original thing from the piano sketch that I liked. And I just kind of wrote a marimba part around it. Mm -hmm. uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. Right. I think one of my favorite parts about like percussion music, like I really, that is so far from what I usually focus on during the season, but
but there's times where like you're warming up and the drum line is next to the color guard and the winds are way in the middle of nowhere, but you can still hear like where where you're at in the music without hearing the wind part. It's and I think it's yeah. like I can I, I've only listened to the wind part a few times. Like I listened to it last week and you know, and like I can recognize the part in the music where it's at right now because of how the percussion part is you know, arranged and how it picks up the melody, but it's not exactly the melody. And I think that's that's one of the cool things, even when it's only the battery playing, there's been programs I've worked with that are only battery and you can still like get the sense of the wind part without the winds being there. So I think that's, I think that's one of the really cool parts about marching, marching percussion. Uh, and I'm going to be honest, I have no idea if that's really the same in like concert percussion, like that kind of stuff. Uh, but that I think that's one of the cool parts about this yeah so case yeah. Point, um actually the section we're at right now um so i'll play the the woodwind feature here <laughs> and we'll see if we can add the snare drums to this and see if you can hear that <laughs> cool so it doesn't take on the same exact you know um rhythm but it still has the rhythmic motifs and honestly something that honestly it blows my mind my mind a little bit um, is that you can kind of go along with pitch with dynamics so as the pitch goes up you can get louder and on a snare drum obviously you don't have melody but that kind of does the trick or at least gets you halfway there to fitting in with a feature like this um, and again same thing with the quads um, going on through the end of movement two here. Um, so we have this little transition here that goes from a more um, minor but not super aggressive feel to all of a sudden really chromatic and super aggressive when the battery comes back in. I'll just play this real quick. So I'm a huge, huge fan of using the front ensemble for those transitions. Um, I just have to say, Jeff, with that writing, that <clears throat> the texture of what we just heard, the front ensemble, the tension and release, and, and the way you just, what, what you're doubling and, and everything you're making sense, the details of the orchestration here, this is probably one of my favorite sections. Of, of what's going on here. I, I love it. I like this. <laughs> you <laughs> Selfishly. Uh, yeah, no, this is, this is my favorite kind of writing to do. Um, it almost feels sneaky. You know what I mean? Like, um, <laughs> I like this vibe a lot. Uh, but you can see kind of here, um, the snare drums line up with the vibraphones here. Mm. Two bottom lines and the quads line up with the marimbas and the xylophones xylophone sorry um and the bass drums are kind of just off in their own little world um with the tubas and low brass um so again it's especially percussion arrangers in this medium really like seeing like i don't even know how many parts i have here but when you scroll down and that's a lot of stuff going on if every one of those people was doing their own thing it would sound like chaos it would just sound insane it would not translate anywhere um, so you really need to find two, maybe three, maybe four things going on at the same time, or else it's just going to sound like mud. Um, it's going to sound like hacking in the band room after school. You don't want that. Um, I like sixth grade band. Yeah. Okay. Don't give sixth grade band too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still, band. Some of my sixth graders are still working on finding the like steady beat with quarter notes. So I mean, Let's, uh, uh, fair, enough, fair <laughs> enough. Some of them are still just making sure they were like putting shoes on. So I, <laughs> I get it. Uh, one last thing here in movement two before we go, before we move on. Um, 
just kind of a cool idea. Um, so we have, again, kind of a sneaky mission. I'll just play it real quick. Cool. Um, so we have super staccato uh, motifs in the winds, pretty much all the way down the score. Um, and I really wanted that in the front ensemble as well, but I didn't want it to overpower anything. Um, I mean, they're mezzo forte, but they're also, you know, however many yards behind. Um, so I have only one marimba playing on the bar with the mallet. Everyone else is playing with the backs of the mallets. So you're still getting the, the pitch of what we're trying to do. Um, but the backs of the mallets are just kind of adding a little bit of brightness to it, but not volume. It's just affecting the timbre of it. Um, which again, we have all these tools to work with. You might as well use them. I mean, it costs absolutely nothing to just pick up a mallet and turn it around. I can do it right here in like one. So I might as well do it. Um, yeah, I think exploring those kinds of options are really, really important. And honestly, they're going to get you points from the judges. I mean, if they see that, not every group's going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You're in a really cool circuit. Um, but um, just just something to, to make it different. Right. A little bit. That's one of my favorite things to add in for color guard choreography. It's like little things that judges might not notice, but if they do, they're going to be impressed. Well, yeah, it just it goes to the variety thing we've said in every single episode so far. Like right. just some simple ways to like keep something consistent, which is the music and the mood of this of this piece, but just done in a different way. Absolutely, it's fascinating that every person we've talked to, guest or people directly with music effect design, like every single person we've talked to has brought up that concept, um, and that's pretty cool. I mean, it makes sense, right? Um, uh, Jeff, um, I have a question for you where we just ended. Um, I know the answer. Um, but when we did dot, 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 this hit, these win hit points and battery moment you have here before we get to the ending, um, just in case, just so everyone knows, what, what all were you given there to work off of? Um, nothing. What, and, yeah, right, nothing. Literally nothing. Um, and again, as, as when I was listening through the first time, um, I knew that this was a battery feature. It had to be. Like, it just wouldn't have, I mean, even if I added, um, you know, mallets in the gaps here, it just wouldn't have the same effect. It wouldn't have the same punch. Um, really, th my only option here was a battery, like, kind of feature, I'll call it. Um, but just so you know what we're talking about, here's the part. <laughs> So nothing super difficult in there, but just the fact that it's the only thing happening. And again, just loud drums are cool. Um, I think it's going to be really effective when it's put on the field. This is one of the sections I'm really looking forward to hearing. Um, Same. I, I, I really, the fun part about this movement to me is and, uh, the opening was so intense and there are moments without it, and like throughout it that are, are, that are as well. But it just unleashes these last, like, three phrases. And it just keeps going more. So, like, the next phrase where we add in these 16th notes, when we were first listening to this earlier, I, I was watching Jordan and Holly's faces because I wanted to see. Because um, when we got to the upcoming part, they were like, uh, <laughs> you go back and watch. It was awesome because it's just so exciting and, and it's because it's kind of crazy. Um, and that's the purpose, right? It's like we're kind of showing something that's pretty off. Um, yeah. So it's fun because you definitely save like kind of the most aggressive stuff, in my opinion, to build it up for the end, which is what we want because the next movement starts with just like, you know, a mallet. Uh, so, um, Jeff, do you have any like final thoughts on like part one or part two? Um, not really that I can think of. I think I covered just about everything I wanted to do. Um, just one small little thing that I just saw. Um, I've watched a few videos of their band. Come on, Spilius. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the pit setup was different than I'm used to. So instead of kind of orchestrating these around the front ensemble, I just put A, B on the cymbal lines. And they can divide that up however they see fit. Um, and they could even change it every time because it happens a few different times. Um, so 
uh, for non-percussionists watching, um, when you're playing cymbals this loud and aggressively, you really don't want them to be played like in succession like that because um, it just changes it changes the sound too much. Um, I demonstrated on the symbol behind me, but it would blow the mic out. Um, but it's it's fatiguing, honestly, um, both your ear and your hands. Um, and it's just a different sound in the palette that you can use, especially if you're standing right in front of the front ensemble, if you're a drum judge and you hear cymbals crashing in like a stereo effect all around you, it's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, that translates to the stands too. Um, but it's also a visual thing. Like you, you hear one rhythm, but you see different people playing it. It's just kind of a cool visual trick you can do. Very cool. Uh, it, those things that you're just talking about there and that you mentioned throughout the past hour of like those little, those little moments, and even just the visual the idea of percussion and the visual element, those are really, really quite awesome. Take like points that like I even noted here, right. That, Oh yeah, I need to start be thinking about those things more. That's pretty cool. Um, Jeff, um, we're, Thank, I mean, thank you for taking us through part one and part two. Um, it has been super fun to hear kind of where your mind's at on all of this. Um, we're going to come back to you here in a moment uh, because we want to ask you for one or two final thoughts. Um, but before we do that, uh, we have just a couple things coming up next week that we kind of want to talk about. Um, Jordan, Holly, do you guys have anything you want to let them know about what's, what to expect? Do I ever? <laughs> um, <laughs> Do I ever? Yeah. So, you know, we're, we're really grateful to have Jeff on and, and we're going to have some more um, things and some more ideas. I don't want to get into too many details tonight um, because uh, I don't know. That's what our show's about, but yeah. <laughs> um, but, I just want the details on percussion for right, now. <laughs> right. um, but we're going to continue to kind of explore this over the next week. You know, that's, that's our idea is we have this assembly line of things that happen one after another, after another, uh, we do have a surprise event later this week. Uh, I'm not going to drop any info about that as we're as we're going in, but check our social media page, like us at Music Effect Design. I think we're on all of the social medias now. Or I think so. We're the... even on Pinterest. So that's true. Yeah, we just launched. I don't know how to use that. You I, got it. It's the best. <laughs> Pinterest is a place I went once and went, ooh, I want to do all these things and then never looked at any of this. So, <laughs> so um, we've got that, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, YouTube right? Yep. Um, yeah, we've cool. got it all. LinkedIn. So, we do have a LinkedIn now. Yeah, we do. that's right. That's we are right. everywhere you can media. Our so. web-based right. manager is a total pro at that, and it's been super helpful yeah. for us. So. Shout out to both Rebecca and Tori. Yep. We don't, you don't get to see them, but... Uh, uh, but they they do outstanding work with with all of that and all Seriously. the stuff they talk about i never know what they're talking about so <laughs> you just kind of um, drool <laughs> that's usually when i know like it's not like these people are smarter than me um <laughs> I'm doing he, good work. they're doing good like work. I'm, I'm gonna have a drink yeah right basically <laughs> um that's just a good excuse in general uh but uh now th one one other thing to also mention um about next week um, is that if you like what you heard tonight, if you're liking like what you're hearing from the wind book and the percussion book combined, like what we've done uh, with Jeff and myself, um, in the next week or so, we're hoping to launch, um, we expect to have it up, the ability, availability to look at these PDFs and scores and listen to some of the MV3 mock-ups that you heard tonight and last week. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of what we have. And we're also open now to start offering our first couple um, arrangements where you can come to our website and actually start purchasing um, sheet music from Music Effect Design. So that's gonna be coming up soon and uh, it's been really fun working with Jeff on those things. Um, Jeff, I wanna really reiterate what uh, Jordan and Holly both said uh, today with thank you so much for coming on. Um, before we conclude, um, do you have just one or two words of wisdom um, about the world of percussion? Yeah, but again, thanks for having me. Um, if I was to give anyone advice about kind of going into this, is to just start. That's the hardest part. It just seems so daunting. Um, but especially as, as a percussionist, I remember being in high school and, you know, looking at the director's stand and seeing the score. And I was just like, what, how does he even know what's going on? Um, but the, the more time you take to understand that and like really put the time into knowing what's going on, you're just going to go so much further. And the other thing is to just start writing too. I mean, I started with tr transcribing cool stuff I found on YouTube um, 
and it's turned into a career for me. So, I mean, it starts as a hobby, but you never know where it's going to go. Um, speaking of, there's so much good information on there for free. You might have to watch an ad or two, but like, there's so much information from, I mean, just Vic Firth's page alone. You can learn anything you want about percussion, concert, marching, whatever. It's all there. So um, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm sure I'll be tagged in the Facebook post about this. Um, I'm super, super You're right. About <laughs> any kind of percussion nerdy stuff you want. Um, yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk. Thanks again for having me, guys. Thank you, Absolutely. Jeff. Seriously. Yeah. I know this has been yeah. like a thank you volleyball for a while, but, this has been, but it's been really great. I was super happy to have you here. Uh, for those of you that have been watching uh, and continue to watch throughout the week, thank you for supporting us, for, um, for listening, because that's what, we, that's what we want is to share all of this with you. If you have questions, reach out to us. Um, you can do that via Messenger on Facebook. Um, we also have our um, email, Gmail, uh, info at musicaffectdesign.com. So you can check us out there as well. Uh, for all of us here, Thank you, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>